Good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, we're going to continue on the subject of ty typography as it pertains to Photoshop. And we'll be using the type tool and we'll be working on lesson seven. I'm not going to do lesson seven in detail. I'm not going to follow the individual steps. But instead, what I do want to do is I want to show you the type tool and all of its functions and how it works. And um, that will get you to covering the lesson without going step by step through it. Okay, The first part of this, the lesson looks like this. That's where we left off with lesson six. And we're simply adding text to it. Okay, that's it. But the text tool is very complex. It's robust. Um, I don't think it's as good as the text tool in Adobe Illustrator. So for those of you who have used Adobe Illustrator, I think you'll find that the, um, the text tool is a much better tool than it is in Photoshop. Photoshop has more limitations. So if you plan on designing a logo, um, if you plan on doing type, working with type in any extensive detailed way, I think Illustrator would be a better choice. But for the sample that we see here, um, it's a good one. Um, it, Photoshop does a, a fine job and that's it. You'll notice a few things. You'll notice the masthead of the, the magazine that we're designing that um, inside the type itself, we have an image, okay? So that image, in fact, um, uh, we're using the type itself is a, is a mask and we can move the image within it. You'll also notice under volume nine, that we can set type vertically. Um, right here, all of the type is being set flush right. Pretty straightforward, but I wanna show you what all the tools do because there's a whole slew of them. There's also, you'll notice that the type curves that can be done a variety of different ways. It can follow a path. There are tools in the type uh, when you apply type that allow you to bend it and warp it. So that's what we're gonna do, All right? So what I've done is I've just set up a brand new untitled file like so. And um, what I would recommend that you do when you are um, working with type is that at the very top here, when we go under the different options that we have for workspaces, I would select where we have, well, and other ones we have for type. I want graphic and web. There should be one for type. No, not anymore. Okay, well, let's work for graphic and web. That's still that that puts the character panel, which is what we will be using for typography at the top of the heap, the top of the list. Okay, so if we look at the properties for type, if we look at the character panel, those are very important, along with the paragraph panel and glyphs, um, should you choose to use any of them, like the hashtag, octothorpe, pound sign, whatever you want to call it. If you want percentages, um, if you want any any of these characters, there are an easy access to them that otherwise it's a little bit different. So that's what I would recommend when you're setting up and you're deciding to work with type. So let's go ahead and work with type. Here's our type tool over here. And I'm just gonna move in the center and I'm gonna make sure that um, at the top, I'm gonna look and see what we have here. By default on my computer, it may be different on yours. It's uh, we have Myriad Pro is the default typeface. And um, the font is regular. If I click and I hold here, you'll see that here are the other fonts that are available to us with Myriad Pro. So we have bold condensed, regular, all the way to bold italic. So I'm just gonna use regular for the moment. And I'm gonna click anywhere on the screen and you'll notice that it, it, it adds by some, some greeking. And it's a little bit small for me. So what I'm gonna do, and this is one feature that I like on Photoshop, is that if you move the mouse over the key in the options menu at the top here, and you click and you drag to the right, 
Notice that it increases the type size, and you'll notice that the type size that's measured in points we talked about on Monday is listed to the right. And if I want to make it smaller, I just drag the mouse to the left. It's really quite nice. So if you're not sure what type size you want to use, you just spin, you know, move the mouse left and right and use the spinner and, until you get to the desired type size. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to replace lorem ipsum, which is the greeting that they provide with just some type. And you'll notice that it's all caps. So I don't want it all caps. So I'm going to look at the character and I'm going to pull this off. And I'm going to look, and the reason it is all caps at the moment is that if I look at the bottom here, you'll notice that this double T is selected. So if I highlight all of this and I turn that off, notice that it goes back to the capital T and the capital S that I used when I hit the shift key. But if I have all the types selected and I want to shift to all caps, I can do that. And there's other features here that we'll talk about shortly. The other thing that we should talk about here is that if we look at the top, and there's a lot of things that are duplicated in here. Um, we see at the top under the, the options menu that I have Myriad Pro. If I click here, you'll see these are all of the fonts that are loaded in my computer. And as I scroll over them, notice that the type changes. So let's look at some of these to see what it looks like. And I don't see anything. There we go. When I let go, it shows it. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click and go back to it. If I also do the same over here under character and I click right here, this says emoji one. I don't know why it does that. I'm going to select Myriad Pro, make sure that that is the typeface that I have selected. And then we have choice, as I said, of a specific font if it's available. The little um, down carrot over here does the same thing. Um, and here, okay. So a lot of things that are duplicated in here. Um, by default, when you um, create type, if we look at the, um, the layers panel, and I check it, make sure that, okay, I'm happy with that. I want some type. You'll notice that it automatically creates a layer for us. And it's on its own layer and that's the nature of type. And that's a good thing because you can change it and you can manipulate it and warp it and you know do whatever you want to it as much as you want. And it works in a non-destructive way this way, you know, on its own layer. You'll also notice that the that the layer name is, it starts off with the characters that we have, um, that we've um, assigned to the type. So that's a help to us in, um, uh, in recognizing which layer we're on, if we have multiple layers of, excuse me, of type. Now, if I come back in here and I click, you'll notice that the little flashing cursor here is where I left off and I can continue to type to my heart's content. You'll also notice if you recall one of the, the things regarding the nomenclature that I covered on Monday is there when I have this selected, you notice that there's a little line underneath here. This is the baseline that we talked about. And if you recall too, the way the type is measured, you'll notice that I have 83 point right now. Well, that's measured from the top of the A center to the bottom of the D center. Now, I don't have an A center in here, but if I were to put a T in here, um, you'll notice that, it's, that it falls just short of the capital letter. Now, with the one that I showed you the other day, it rose above the cap. Okay, but that's how that's measured. It goes from just below cap height down to the bottom of the D center, which is actually a very short D center. Now, if I click at the end and I decide I want to type some more, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to type some more. It just goes in a straight line. It just keeps it will type forever in a single line. And it will continue to do that until I come back here and I hit the backspace and I hit the return key and then it goes to a separate line. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to 
instead of type some more, I'm just going to say some more or more type down here. Okay. So now we have a second row and it's all part of the same layer. So I'll have to put in more type. There you go. Now the space between these, if you recall, as I said is the letting. And it looks a little bit horsey to me. It's a little bit too much space, but that's the, for 83 point, that's the default letting that's used. So let's go over each of these to show you what they do. <clears throat> so I've typed a little bit of type. I'm done with it. <clears throat> and while it's highlighted, I can highlight again and I can change the color of it. I can come back in here and I can turn that to red. And I can turn a single letter form into let red or an entire line or entire group. So that's what that's done. That can either be done here or that can be done over here. A couple of different places. Now, in addition to that, what we have here is that we can control the size from here, or as I showed you just a moment ago, we can control it from here. So I can go ahead and I can make it larger and it will make just whatever I have selected larger. Okay. So if I want it to be, you know, 92 point up here, and I want it to be maybe this instead of 83, I'm going to go ahead and type it in instead of using the spinner. I'll make it 84 point here. So just a little bit bigger. So this controls the size of it. Now the one to the right over here controls the letting. And if you recall from my uh, Monday uh, lecture, that controls the space between the lines. So if I highlight both of these and I either type in a specific number and right now it's set to auto, I can select none. Okay, so maybe I want um, six points. And notice that it overlaps, okay, because it's a weird kind of numbering system, but if you use 83 on 83 or 84 on 84, it will be kind of the bare bones minimum of what you need to have separate lines of type. So if I hit 72, that's still pretty tight. You'll notice that it overlaps just a little bit. And again, I can use the little spinner here. I can click and drag to increase the amount of letting, or I can um, click over it and move my mouse to the left to decrease. Now, since you guys are working on your postcard and the next in the next assignment, you'll be working on a movie poster. When you have, you know, just a few words set for your title, um, and typically the type is quite large, you're not going to want a, a huge gap between the separate lines of type. You're going to want them fairly tight because you want it to read as a unit, like a logo or a single element. And that's just good design. Nothing more, nothing less. So this is the tool that allows you to do that. The next tool over here with the V and the A controls the kerning. So if you recall, kerning controls the space, individual space between letter forms and words. So if I place the cursor between the E and the T, for example, and if I wanted less space between those two words, again, I could use a specific number. I could click on this little bot down carrot here and I can say that I want less. So if I put a negative 100, notice that it, type, it tightened up just a little bit. Or I could use a spinner again and I can really tighten it up so that, you know, the actually, you know, the key um, over, hangs over the E. And for some um, titles, for some logos that you design or that sort of thing, that might be the desired effect. If I ever want to go back to the original setting, I just come back over here and I select zero and it goes back to the default. For body copy, I would leave those settings alone. But for large you know, blocks of type, this is where you're going to want to tweak it and individualize it. So that controls the, the kerning. Okay, that's what that is. Again, if I were to put the cursor between any two letter forms or between any words, that will allow me to adjust that. The next one here over to the right, the other VA, 
is tracking. And I talked about that the other day. That is the uniform adjustment of space between lines of type. So let's say, for example, where I have more type underneath, I want it to be the same width. I don't want to change the height, um, but I want it to be the same width as the line above it where it says some type. Well, I can go ahead and I can either put in a specific number or I can spin it here and move my mouse. And there you go. Now I have two lines of type. The bottom one, I incorporated tracking because maybe for, you know, for design reasons, for aesthetics, I want the second line to be the same width as the top one. But I don't want to change the height. I don't want to change the font. I don't want to do anything else to it. I just want to change the spacing uniformly between the letters. So that's what that one does. Um, the next one down here is a tricky one, and the same with the one to the right. So let me go ahead and um, highlight this again, and I'll show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take where I have that tracking, and I'm going to go back to zero. And let's say I want to keep the spacing between the letter forms the same, but I want to change just the width of the type. So if I do that, Notice that it's stretching the type. It's not changing the space between the letter forms, but it's changing the width of the type. So it's actually distorting it a little bit. Okay. So I, it's, it's another way to get the same width. I don't recommend that you use this tool that often unless you feel really comfortable using type. Um, it, for type designers and graphic designers who are type hounds, that's just a no no. Um, somebody has spent you know, months and months designing a font and being very careful about the proportions that they use and for each size and so on and so forth for, for a particular font. And that just destroys all of it. Okay. The one next to it over here controls the height. So for example, let's say I have this amount of width, but I want the height of my type to be taller or shorter. Well, I can do that here as well. So for example, if I wanted it much higher, I wanted to create it so it looks like it's sort of condensed. And again, it distorts the, the type when I do that. Okay, so notice what happens. Likewise, if I want it the same width, but I want it shorter, I could go ahead and I can do that as well. And its relationship to the baseline remains the same. So if I keep squishing it, flattening it, it looks like it's um, extended type. If I do it the other way, it looks like it's condensed. Okay, so now I can go back and I can just go back to 0%, go back to the default setting here. Whoops, come on, zero. Uh, 0%. Zero percent. Nope. What am I doing here? Oh, I want a hundred percent. Sorry. Ta-da! Not zero, a hundred. I don't know why I did that. I goofed. The next one down <clears throat> here controls the the types, the individual letter forms, or an entire line. Their relationship to the baseline. So, for example. What if I wanted, um, let's click in here. What if I wanted OME to rise above the baseline? Well, I could go ahead and again, I could put in a specific point or I could use a spinner and I could move it up. So I, I mean, I could actually move it above. So if I wanted it some type, I could do that. Okay. So that allows you to manipulate, again, the individual letters or an entire word separately from all the rest. That's how that one, this one works. Okay, this adjusts the, the type and its relationship to the baseline. So I'm going to undo that, go back. So what are the next, what do all these series do down here? Well, <clears throat> if I want everything to be 
um, bold. Um, and it's a faux bold because if I look up here under regular and I say, you know what, I want bold. Oh, I do have that as a choice. That's the one that you should choose. So if I wanted more type to be bold, I would make sure that it was selected and switch from regular to bold. Okay, notice that that affects the width of the line and everything else. So if, uh, still, if I want it to be the same, um, you know, distance or width as the line of type above, I would have to make adjustments. So now it's bold. If I go back and I change this to the normal, let me go ahead and do that and go back to regular, okay? But if the font that I was using did not have bold as an option, and I really wanted it to be a little bit heavier, I wanted a faux bold, then I would select it and I would click on this button right here. And notice that it rounds off some of the, the edges a little bit and it just sort of fattens it a little and it's not really as clean as the, the version that I used before. So that's what that does. Uh, same with italic. If you want kind of a faux italic, then you would click this one right here. And it gives you that, an italicized version. If you want all caps, then you click here. And that gives you by default all caps and you don't have to type it. The next one, which is extremely useful, gives you something called small caps. Now, I've said that um, for, <clears throat> for, for most he headlines and subheads, you can use any of the five categories of type that I talked about, whether it be serif, sans serif, um, you use script, um, you use um, black letter or a decorative typeface, it really doesn't matter. But if you have a large block of type, um, I warn you against using all caps, all caps, um, like some decorative typefaces are very difficult to read when you have a large block of text. But instead, what you can do is that you can use initial caps. And that's what this one does right here. If I click here, whoops, not that one. Let me go back. Let me select this again. No, I didn't do it. So why didn't it do that? That's interesting. It made it all. Okay. Oh, I see why. Never mind. Never mind. I'm going to go ahead here. I'm going to make this one a capital letter. So this will be capital M. And this one will be a capital T. There we go. So that looks, you know, more type reads very easily. And it's all in capital letters, but these are small caps. So if I go back and I highlight all of this and I turn that off, notice that it goes back to caps and it goes back to the small letter forms or lowercase. But as soon as I click on this again, it goes from initial caps and then the small letters revert to caps, but on a smaller scale. That works really well for titles very often. Titles of books, titles of, you know, um, of posters, any number of things. So that might be an option that we would have. Another thing that we have after here is, let's say for example, I have, I need to put more type version one. So I put a one. Well, that's awfully big. If I want that to be a superscript, I click on that and it reduces it in size and it pushes it above. Instead, if I want it to be a subscript, I select that and it pushes it below. So that's what this one does. And again, they can all be reversed. Okay. Then I have these other two options here. <clears throat> I have, if I want this to be underlined, then I highlight it and I underline it. If I want a strike through, then I highlight what I want with a strike through and I click this and I get that. Okay. So let me go ahead and highlight that and turn that back off. Okie doke. 
So a few other things, and I don't know that if you noticed, I said there's a lot of things that you can do with type, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Get it to warp, bend, follow a path, do a number of things. Um, when, before I do though, let's talk about some of these down here. These have to do with um, ligatures and, and, gifts, and glyphs. Um, some fonts <coughs> are built with ligatures built in if you want to use them. So for example, if I had, let's see, let's switch to a different font here. I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna switch to, from Myriad Pro to, um, how about Times Roman? Let me look for it. I just want Serif for the moment. And I'm gonna to switch to Times Roman. I'm gonna move this over here. Times New Roman, there we go. And I'm gonna type an FI. Whoops, and I don't want all caps. So let's go back and make sure that that's turned off because it, it reverts to the last line that I used. So if I put in FI, notice how the F and the I are together, that they read as a single character. Again, for aesthetics, that can look kind of nice. If I turn that off, notice that they read now as individual. Not all fonts have that. That's an option. The same with the rest of these. You know, if I want to insert, um, you know, if I put in a half, like so, that's what this does. It does it automatically. If I highlight it, I turn that off. Notice how big it is. It doesn't look very appealing. That's kind of like the superscript or subscript. That's what all of these do. The same with first, second, and a variety of different things, the different variations on typefaces. It's a bit more sophisticated, okay? And it gives us lots and lots of options. So that's what they do. I'll come to these um, probably near the end where it says English USA. So let's say, for example, I wanna do some, a few uh, fun things with my type here. So I can highlight this or leave this selected. And you'll notice at the top here in my options menu, I have something called create warped text. This can be very effective um, for titles. If I click that, a little dialog box pops up. And again, this is um, non-destructive. It can be changed at any time, removed or edited and changed. So if I select from none, and let's select arc, for example, notice that it arcs the type. And at least it, when I'm done with it, if I'm happy with this, the type remains to be, um, it just arc the upper part like so. Let's try another one. Let's try, um, uh, let's try flag. There you go. And again, you can control um, the bend you know, do you want a lot of bend? Do you want just a little bit of bend? Do you want the bend to go in the other direction? Do you want to change the horizontal distance? You know, create some really, you know, some interesting looks. And the reason that this is so nice is that let's switch from flag. Let's go back to um, shell upper, see how that works. And I'm going to switch for the band here. And I'm gonna go back here to horizontal distortion. I want none. I have to go back and reset these like so. Okay, well, I didn't like that after all. Well, there's another one that I would prefer. Let me try something different. Um, which one? Let's just try the upper arc, like so. Let's go ahead and distort this like crazy. There we go. Okay, so I'm happy with that. But notice that I can come back and I can highlight this. So if I'm designing a logo for myself, so if I put Kirk Miller, I can change and I can, I can edit the fonts. I can change the type. I can do whatever. I can continually edit this until the cows, excuse me, come home. <clears throat> Okey doke. 
So for example, maybe I want to change it from regular to bold. Maybe I want to change the font. So let's highlight everything. Let's do that. I'm going to switch to something bolder. I'm going to switch to something like impact. So let's go to, um, I want more than just serif. I want all classes. Well, um, let's just say all classes. And I want impact. Impact is a nice, notice as I, as I scroll over these, let's, let's switch with this one. Okay. This is black more. This is kind of funky looking. You know, it's uh, uh, old style, old English. Okay. And I want to use that for my logo. Okay. So I'm going to leave that there for the time being. I haven't done much at all, but it has a unique look to it now. It might be good for a title for um, of a book or um, a poster. Okay. So those are some of the things that we can do. So I'm going to go ahead and check that. Okay. Now let's let's look at some of the other things that we can do with this. So let's look at the finished version here. Let's look at the end. And you can see here that you'll notice that the type follows a path. Well, I could have used the flag and you know worked with separate layers and rotated them to get that effect. I can also create a path and I can have the type align itself to that path as well. So that's what I want to show you, show you next. So let's go ahead here. And I got to make sure that this is deselected so that when I select type, um, it creates a separate layer for itself. Now, to do that, you need to create the path first. So what I'm going to do, and if I hold down the type tool, you can see that I can set it vertically from here or normal here. But I'm going to go ahead and click here. And under the, I have the chain convert point tool. I'm going to use the pen tool at the moment. And I don't want it to be a shape layer. I only want it to be a path. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to click and drag like so. I'm going to click and drag like so. I'm going to click and drag like so. So there's my path. Now I want the type that I'm going to create to follow that path. So I'm going to switch to the type tool. And I'm going to make sure that it's flush left. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. Let me go back to centered. I want to make sure that I have, I'm going to deselect that first. So let's go back here. There we go. Now I'm going to go ahead and select the type tool. And I want to make sure that it's flush left. I don't want, why is it doing that? Let me go back. Um, centered. Let's go back here and just select the background layer. There we go. Now I can click anywhere. You'll notice that as I move the cursor over the path, the cursor changes with a little wavy line underneath, which means that it is going to connect to that path. When I click on there, you can see that it's doing that. I don't want it centered though. I want it flush left and now it, it, so that it attaches to the end. And now what I can do is I can type in here. Again, I can type Kirk Miller. And it's not working for me because I need to click here. Let's go back to the, this is why I like um, I'm going to move this along here like so. There we go. I, this little point here the ball along the path tells me where the end of the path is. And if I move the type of the cursor above or below, I can have it move upside down or I can have it go right side up. But this determines the end of my path. And you can see that it's following the path. Now, if I switch here and I look at the cursor, I can slide that along the path. So it's like it's on rails. Now, it's not limited to individual paths like this. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to deselect and make sure that we have nothing selected here. And let's try something else. I'm going to switch. And I, what if I want this to follow a circle? So I'm creating a little logo. So I'm going to make a circle here. And I don't want it to be a shape layer. I want it to be a path. So I'm going to go ahead and click and drag and make my path. 
And then I'm going to go ahead and deselect it. So, so I just see the path. Now I'm going to select type again. And I like it centered this time, maybe. And no, I didn't want to do that. I got to go ahead and I got to select here. There we go, a different layer. Now notice again, when I put the cursor over it, I click and I get the type follows the path. Now I can switch back to here to the move tool for type. I can have it follow underneath or above. And again, you'll notice that little ring at the bottom here. I need to change that like so. This is where it gets really kind of weird. I one on the outside, the inside. And then I can, yeah, see I'm having trouble. There's the start and then I have the end. And I want it to be like so. And you, you know, fiddle with it a little bit and it fits the outside. So it can go on the outside or the inside. Now, one of the things where this might be useful to you, and that's why I said, you know, before that, well, when would I ever want to change the type and its relationship to the, um, the, um, the base baseline? If I highlight the type here, if I want it to truly sit, sit on the outside of that path, I can do that now. I can change this and move this outward. So it's still following that path, but it's on the outside of it. So if I want it on the outside of the logo that I've created, that's what that would do. Okay. And you'll notice for each one of these that I've created, it creates its own layer. So I can always go back and edit it. I can always go back and change the color of individual letter forms, or I can change the color of an entire um, line of type. I can add any of these layer effects like bevel and you name it. So one of the other things that we want to do, let me get rid of some of this. Remember I said we we're going to do something a little bit more with this one. Let's say I want an image to be inside this. Well, what I need to do is I need to open an image first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat. I'm going to go back over here. And let's see, here it is here. I'm going to take this layer right here. And I only want to see that. So let's take and I'll hold down the option key. And here's the image that they provided for us as a TIFF file. Well, I'm going to use the move tool and I'm going to drag it over to my document here and pull it down and release it and let it go like so. So now you'll notice that this image is resting above the type. It's on a layer directly above the type. I want the type to serve as a, um, as a clipping mask. So with it, with the image directly above the type, and it has to be above, then I move the cursor in between those two layers. I hold down the Option key on the Mac, the Alt key on the PC, and I click. And you can see that that is now inside the type. So that can provide a really, really, you know, with not much muss or fuss, a really interesting appearance. Then in addition to that, I can come down here. Let's, let's add a drop shadow. And all of this continues to be editable. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move this over just a little bit. Let's change the distance a little bit. Let's change the spread the size. Um, let's preview this. Why isn't it showing up? Oh, because the wrong one. Let me make sure that this is selected. Let's cancel that. Let's make sure that I have the correct layer selected. I need the type layer selected, not the circuit board layer. So let's try that again. Got to be careful which layer you select. So let's select the drop shadow. There you go. So now notice that that's popping from the background. It looks pretty nice, you know, even with the default settings here. Let's give it a little bit more depth. Let's go ahead and add bevel and emboss. So I'm going to click here. 
And now if I change some of the settings here, let's change the depth a little bit. Let's go ahead and change the size a little bit. And it's looking three dimensional. And again, what is really nice with this, you know, it's easy to really uh, to overdo it with this. But as you can see, you can create some, some really elegantly designed, um, some over the top designed uh, type very quickly and uh, really, you know, in a very short amount of time and make sure that it's non-destructive so that it can always be edited. If I wanna change the font, if I notice that I misspelled something, I can always do that. And notice you have to make sure that you have what line, what layer you have selected. It might be a good idea for me to hold down the shift key, select the type layer and the circuit board and link them together so that when I use the move tool to move them, they move in unison with one another. Okay, so that's another thing we can do with that. That's another part of the exercise that we're working with. And as I mentioned too, let's go ahead and let's click here for type. And we can also set type vertically. So if I click here, notice that if that's your choice, let's go ahead and change the size of that. So that's not quite so big. You can do that. It's rare that you set type vertically. It's not that common. Um, again, it's difficult for the reader to read vertical type. I don't recommend it, except maybe in the instance that's used for the design of this um, magazine cover. And that would be about it. The other thing that I mentioned, Let's go back here. Um, I said at the very end, I said, it's, how are we doing on time? Got a little bit more time. That right now it's set to English. So I'm gonna switch back to normal type here, horizontal. And I'm gonna go back to just plain old font here. So let's go back to, from black letter, I'm gonna go back to Myriad Pro. And I'm gonna click here. And I'm going to type Montreal. And I'm going to make it a little bit bigger just so you can see everything. Now, I pick Montreal for a reason, is that um, in the States, we, we, the spelling for Montreal is, goes one way. And if you were in Montreal, you know, in Quebec, and you spoke, you know, French, then, um, you know, Canadian French, it would be spelled slightly differently. It would have an accent over the E. So right now we're in English. So if I highlight all of this, because let's say your document is going to be printed in multiple languages, you could have a different layer for each language. And I'm going to switch to French Canadian here. And you don't see any, any, any change at all. <clears throat> but if I come back and I click OK, and I go up to Edit, <clears throat> and I say that I want to do Check Spelling, you'll notice that Montreal, it shows that it's misspelled. It says change to this Montreal with an accent grave over the E. So if I go ahead and I say Change, and I click done, it's automatically done a spell check for me. Quite nice. So let's go back and change this now to English and see what it does. If I go back instead of French Canadian, I switch and I go back to English and notice that they have English USA English and they have UK English. They have Canadian as well. And now we do the same thing. I have, it, I have the word highlighted. I go up to edit. I select um, check spelling and the little dialog box comes up and it notices that it's changed. Now for most of us here in the States, if you left the accent um, rav over the E, um, it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, it would be a big deal if this document were shipped to um, 
Quebec, you know, to Canada, and it didn't have the accent over the E, it would be a, a huge mistake. But now I can go ahead and I can select change, click OK, and I'm done. So that's what this does down here. Then you can specify too, do you want it sharp, crisp, strong, smooth, Mac LCD, you know, any number of variations. By default, it's set to sharp, and that's typically how I leave my type. Okie doke. I think I have covered almost everything. Let's go back here and let's take a peek and let's turn all of this back on. And let's also go back here, hold down the option key, have that fit in there. I don't know, I may have mentioned that I've been switching and I switched to centered, but you have flush left, flush right. And because type exists on its own layer, you can move it around at any time that you want. Um, move it around where you, you know, set the type really is unimportant because it, because it does exist on its own layer. You can put it in any position you want at any time. Oh, there is one more thing that I forgot. I told you that the only way you could create a separate line of type was to hit the return key. That's not true. Um, what you can do is you can select the type tool and I can click and drag like so. Let's say I want a text box that big. Notice that the type fits in that text box now and it's limited to that and it will automatically um, wrap to the next line. So I can go ahead and I'll change um, the point size here to something that's more manageable like uh, there you go. We'll make it um, 14 point or 18 point, which is still pretty big. And you'll notice that the letting is 72 point. We don't want that. I'm going to go back here and I'm going to say auto. Notice that it automatically wraps from line to line to line. And as I change the size of this, you know, I don't have height here, but if I, if I had to add type, and if I move this in, Notice that it's changing the configuration of the type to fit the space that I have. That's how that works. And then when I move back to the move tool, I can move this block of text around. But again, there are much better say, settings um, available for blocks of text in Adobe Illustrator that if you want to switch from one column to two to three to four, it does that on the fly. If you want to create an object, that sits on top of the type and you want the type to wrap around the text, that can be done very easily. There's a lot of features um, pertaining to text that exist in Illustrator that just don't exist in Photoshop. So if I had something that I wanted to design with text that was a little bit more sophisticated, um, then I would probably do all of my photo editing in Photoshop and bring that photo into Illustrator and then finish it up um, using the text available in Illustrator. That would be my choice. Okay. So there you have it. There is the introduction to typography in Photoshop. Are there any questions from any of you? Yes, no? No, no questions. Any questions about the project? Any questions about any other lessons? If not, then we are good for today. That's all I wanted to cover. Next week, we'll probably be working on lesson eight. You have a question, Jess? Okay, go for it. Okay, um, hold on one second. Jess, let me um, elevate you to live. So hold on here. Um, let me put in participants and then Jess, there we go. So I'm gonna elevate you, I'm gonna promote you to panelist. And then I'm going to um, let's see, under Q&A, 
Yeah, I see it now. Okay. Okay. What I was wondering was uh, you had earlier when you first were were putting up the words Kirk Miller, you had the line there, the the pathway, and as you drew the cursor to the end of the pathway, the text slid underneath. What I was wondering is, can you do a mirror image of the text so that the K would appear below in a mirror for, format? And yeah. Um, so the easy, what, well, the easy way to do that is let me go ahead and select these two layers here. These are linked together, and I hope it will do it. But I would first have to copy the layer. Okay, so rather than set it that way, I would set it normally, and then you can always rotate it and flip it and do a number of things. So I'm going to select both of these layers, and I'm going to duplicate them. I'm just going to hit the duplicate, like so. And now what I want to do with these duplicates, since they're sitting directly on top of one another, I want to go to um, Edit, and I want to go to Transform, and I want to Flip vertical. And now I can move it down. Okay. And there's my mirror image. Beautiful. Okay. And if I wanted to flip it horizontally, I could do that as well. Oh, okay. So right. that's Great. useful Thank in you. some instances, not in all instances, but it's useful for creating um, shadows. It's also useful for creating reflections, things like that, at least getting you started. Mm -hmm. Sometimes by flipping the horizontal and the vertical for mirror images. No, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. That helps. Okay. Yeah. Glad to help. Okie doke. Um, I'm checking. Let me go ahead and pause the recording. So that's it for today. Um, you guys are free to leave. And as soon as you're, everybody's left, I will end my session unless you want to stick around and you have some private questions. Well, there is one here from CLBAR to panelists. Um, you're trying to catch up. What chapters have we done? We have done one through seven now. And everybody is to be working on the postcard assignment. We're going to be done with lesson 12, be probably by midterm. And that's the last one that you are responsible for. Um, so there are some other videos that we'll be watching. So there's plenty of time to catch up with the lessons. So if you're a little bit behind with the lessons, that's OK. If you finished one through four and six, then I would get to work on the postcard assignment that will be due in a few weeks. And then you'll have plenty of time to catch up on the lessons. Does that answer your question? Yes, no, okay. Okay, that's all for now then. Um, everybody is free to go. And I'm going to pause the recording and say goodbye for today and have a good weekend. I will see um, some of you on Monday. Bye-bye.